Well, amen. I'm glad that's true. And I'm glad that we're not just up here giving our opinions and ideas and philosophies. We have the Word of God. And it, it just, the more you read it, the more true you realize that it is. And it's just amazing, really. I'm going to invite you to turn to Psalm 2 tonight. Psalm 2, and we're going to look into some Bible principles regarding nations and then what our founders believed about all of this and how it could apply in a practical sense to an actual nation. So, Psalm 2. Now, before we uh, get to that passage, I'm going to uh, refer to several others here, and then we'll, we'll get to Psalm 2 in just a moment. But let's pray, first of all. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight and for this church family. Thank you for their kindness and uh, hospitality shown toward us. And thank you for their faithfulness here in this community and for the fruits of their labor. Uh, we just pray that you continue to have your hand upon them. Bless them. Bless Pastor and his family. Uh, give each one here wisdom, Lord, as they uh, try to teach the truth to this generation, try to love people, try to give the gospel. And we just pray that you would strengthen them, encourage them. Lord, help all of us, help Bible preaching churches all across this land to uh, engage in the fight, to stand against the wiles of the devil, and having done all to stand. Lord, arm us with the truth. Help us to understand these principles. Help us as we look at history that we would... Be inspired to take a stand in our day, in our time. And I pray that we could answer the question, will you find faith when you come again? That the answer would be yes, Lord, that, that we would be faithful when you come back. And I just pray that you would bless the service tonight. And we'll thank you for what you do in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So this principle of under God, that's what we're going to uh, consider. And first of all, we have the Bible principles regarding God's God and nations. So these principles are all throughout. And as we talked uh, this morning about the beginning of nations in Genesis 10, that was really God's plan. That was God's idea. And the truth is he created individuals originally. Life is really all about individuals and families. He created Adam and Eve, put them together, said, have a family, go forward and obey me, do the will of God, explore this planet. I've put all kinds of good stuff on here, uh, fruits and vegetables. I've put uh, uh, minerals in the ground and gold and silver and things that you can build with, uh, all kinds of things to explore, animals to study. Go, live life. And Kings and nations didn't come along until after the flood, right? So really all of that is kind of because of the sin nature. God never, in other words, God didn't create kings and put them in the Garden of Eden. That came about later as a result of our sin nature. So after the flood, then God says, we're going to set up government. Then he says, we're going to uh, make nations so that one person doesn't govern the whole world. And it, and it makes it that much harder for uh, a tyrant to break through all the language barriers. But all a nation really is, is a group of individuals. We just happen to live close to each other and we speak a common language, right? That's all it is. We're all, we're all from Noah. And if you go back further, we're all from Adam. So I like to say that we're all cousins. And it really doesn't matter what your skin color is or what your language is. We're human beings, right? Paul said in the Sermon on Mars Hill, there's really one race. It's the human race. So Satan loves to divide and, and uh, use all of these differences to create contention. But the truth is God had put all of those variations within our DNA. And the only reason that we appear to be different is because uh, of, of smaller communities and we took on traits of those that went before us. But, you know, if you want to lose all those characteristics, just mix and marry and, and, uh, and it won't be long before you'll lose those characteristics. So it's really nothing to get too worried about or excited about. I think it's something to kind of celebrate that, that God put that in us and it makes each of us gives us that unique character uh, that we wouldn't have otherwise had. So all a nation is, is a bunch of individuals that God created. They live close together. They speak the same language. And God is going to bless or be obligated to punish that people group. 
And we see this throughout the Bible as God blesses or punishes families. We see that he does that with churches, right? Uh, In the book of Revelation, they had the seven churches. Each one of them had a different judgment or a different uh, response from God. And he was looking at them as a group in that situation, even though when we stand at the judgment seat or the great white throne, it's individuals. But God does bless people groups. Uh, and we see this in the scriptures about nations. So God is going to either bless your nation or not. And I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed. I want our kids to be blessed. I want our kids to grow up in a place of peace and prosperity and blessing. And the Bible tells us how that can happen. So it wouldn't really matter if you lived in China or uh, Ghana, Africa, or some island out in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Your people group, you ought to want them to be blessed because that's where you live. And here we are as Americans, we live in this nation. We ought to want to be blessed. Whatever that takes, whatever God said, let's do it. Because of all the nations, this is the one we live in. But it's very unique, America is, because, and I'm learning more and more as we go along in this ministry, how many other nations look to us for leadership. And our nation does, we're sitting in a very unique position in world history that we have the opportunity to influence so many other nations for good or for bad. And my prayer is that we would get our act together, have revival, and be a blessing not only to our own children, but to these other nations around the world that are looking to us for leadership. And I hear it over and over again. We're praying for America. We're praying for America. Are you guys going to take a stand? Why are you letting it get this bad? You know, and uh, so what do we do about our country? This is our country. And it ought to matter because this is where we live. We shouldn't really be disconnected from all of this. Besides that, God has given us these principles that we could learn from them. So Psalm 33, 12, you've probably heard, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You want to be blessed? Make sure God is in his rightful spot, that he is Lord. And you're not ashamed to recognize that. Look at Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. And the word forget there has a couple of possible meanings and just looking into that word in the Hebrew but it, it can have the idea that, oops, we forgot. But it also has the idea, we don't want to remember. And it's kind of like in Romans 1 where it says, we will not give God thanks. And we do not like to retain God in our knowledge. That's an act of the will. Don't tell me about God. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about your prayers. That kind of thing. And when you get to that point, the Bible tells you what's going to happen to your nation. It's not going to be good. Psalm 2 is where we're at tonight. And uh, just look at verse number 2 here. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. So the, this particular psalm is addressed to the nations, and he's talking about the kings and the rulers. They're against two things, the Lord and his anointed. His anointed is the word for Messiah, so we're talking about Jesus Christ. And even though that's a thousand years before he he was born, we're talking about Jesus. In fact, if you look over at verse 7, it says, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So we're talking about the only begotten Son of God in Psalm 2. Pretty amazing, isn't it? He He wasn't going to be born for another thousand years, but kings despised him even then. So it's kind of the default setting when a, when a guy gets a bunch of power and uh, wealth and a military, so it goes to his head. Something happens. It's like they're, all of a sudden they're power hungry and they don't want to ever let that slip from their hands. And you know in the Old Testament, isn't it amazing how they would kill off the family and kill off anyone that was a threat to the throne? That's what man does. And it seems to be the default setting that God is despised by these guys. That that's just, if you're going to be in government, you're going to be in control, you don't want God getting in your way because God's people will follow God first. And that's a threat to the tyrant's power. So it's interesting. The Bible addresses this. And uh, in fact, 
if we go down to verse number 10, he says, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. In other words, you don't have to be this way. You can be wise. You can learn. What you ought to do, verse 11, is serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So instead of rejecting Jehovah the Creator, instead of teaching your kids that there is no Creator, why don't you just serve the Creator? Isn't it amazing that when it comes to curse words, it's God and Jesus that seems to be the words of preference. <laughs> there's a lot of other names. Why aren't we using any of those? And there's a lot of other religious leaders, but I've never heard anyone use Muhammad's name or, or any other name because there's something about God and Jesus Christ that is powerful. And man instinctively knows it. And you're never really going to be happy until you get to the point where instead of rejecting him and cursing him and mocking him and trying to act like he doesn't exist, you just need to surrender and say, all right, Lord, we belong to you. We'll surrender. You created us. You have every right to tell us what is right and wrong. And we ought to submit to you. Serve the Lord with fear. Verse 12 says, kiss the son. What about Jesus? What about the Messiah? Come to him. Don't, don't anger him and, and bring his judgment upon you. You ought to embrace him, kiss him, uh, love him, thank him for being willing to die in your place. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. I like the last line of verse 12. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Blessed are all they fruitful, prosperous, happy, are all they that put their trust in him. And again, this is talking about nations. This is talking about kings and their people. You want your nation to be blessed? Serve the Lord, the creator, and trust Jesus. Amen. It's really that simple. And these are amazing universal truths way before there was ever a white American male Christian you know, that, that seems to get all the uh, uh, accusation now, you know, for ruining everything. No, these principles have been around way before there was ever in America. These are eternal, unchanging principles from God's Word. Amen. And it wouldn't matter what nation would submit to it and do it and have revival and lift up the Lord and lift up Jesus. That nation's going to be blessed. So... I'll give you one more here, Psalm 96, verse 5. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Verse 7 says, Given to the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, given to the Lord glory and strength. Verse 8, Given to the Lord the glory due unto his name. Why is it so hard? This is, again, not, Psalm 96 is aimed at nations also. So wait, wait, wait. You mean it's possible for a nation, this community of people, to say, hey, around here, we love the Lord. And we're not ashamed of Jesus. That's just the way it is. You, we can't make you be a Christian because that's between you and God. But our default setting is going to be, we do believe in Him. Amen. Is that even possible? Could a nation do that? Sure, a nation could. Yeah. Just because it's rare doesn't mean it's not possible. And God is telling us, you want to be blessed? This is how. So let's look at our history as Americans uh, uh, of this principle of being a nation under God. That's in our pledge, right? One nation under God. What does that even mean? Well, I'm going to point out some quotes here, and we, and again, there's books and books and books this thick, you know, about with all these quotes and with all the documentation, so it's really not hard. It's not like we're making anything up here. We just don't talk about it that often, right? So uh, I'm just going to kind of skim across history, starting with the pilgrims up to current times, and talk about this principle. So in the first charter of Virginia, 1606, by the providence of Almighty God, to the glory of His divine majesty in propagating of the Christian religion. This was part of the charter there to go to Jamestown. And I just find it interesting that they're acknowledging Almighty God 
and Jesus Christ. We're not, we want to propagate. We want to be missionaries. We want to help people get saved through Jesus. Look at the Mayflower Compact, 1620, Plymouth, Massachusetts. Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith, a voice to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. It's right in, it's right in their compact that they wrote on the boat before they got off to govern themselves. And they said, look, let's make it clear why we're here, for God's glory and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Interesting, isn't it? Now, we're skipping about 150 years in the, the great uh, awakening and all of that, but we're going right up to our, the, the founder of our country, or the indispensable man, the father of our country. He said, It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. I didn't just cherry-pick one quote. There are tons of them. But we don't have time to do them all, plus you get glazed over after a while if I do all these quotes. But George Washington, in his inaugural address, said, of all the nations on earth that ought to give God thanks, it's this one. Because there is no way we got here without his help. And I mean, he said this kind of stuff over and over. His farewell address, he says the same thing. They were not afraid to give God the glory. Were they making, did they want some kind of theocracy where everyone has to, like a Christian version of Muslim nations where, you know, if you don't get saved, we're going to execute you, we're going to tax you more? Not at all. In fact, we'll see why in just a minute. They weren't looking for some theocracy where everyone has to be Christian. But they were not afraid to give God the glory and to recognize Him that He is the Creator and that from Him come all of our rights and our understanding of the whole concept of government. Because God gave us government. He should know how to run one. He, he should be able to give us the principles about how to do this right. Um, ben Franklin said, It is that particular wise and good God who is the author and owner of our system that I propose for the object of my praise and adoration. Since He has given us reason, reason, the ability to reason, whereby we are capable of observing His wisdom in the creation, He is not above caring for us, being pleased with our praise and offended when we slight Him or neglect His glory. So we don't, we don't even know that Ben Franklin got saved. He was a pen pal with George Whitfield and certainly heard the gospel, certainly was in that culture where, you know, 52 out of 56 of the signers were openly Christian Guys, and Ben Franklin's one that we're not sure if he ever got saved. I hope he did before he died. But even Ben said, there's a God in heaven. And if he gave us enough sense to be able to recognize his handiwork, then he is surely going to be offended if we neglect him. And he's going to be pleased if we honor him. So I choose to honor him. I'd much rather have God's blessing on my nation. He said, God, who is the author and owner of our system. We couldn't have come up with this without God. In fact, it was Ben Franklin who stood there and said in the Constitutional Convention, gentlemen, we didn't pray. We've been at this for six weeks, fighting and arguing. How is it we didn't pray? If a sparrow can't fall to the ground without God's notice, how could an empire ever rise without his aid? Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. If we don't get God's wisdom in on this, we'll be no better than the builders of Babel. Referring back to Nimrod. I mean, that's Ben Franklin. And he's saying, we better pray. I move that we have a local preacher come in and pray before our sessions and help us out because we're at an impasse. And if this doesn't work, the whole thing's going to fall apart. And not only will America fail, but I fear that the hope of a, a democratic republic, a, a government of the people, I fear that it will never be tried again. We've got to get this right. It's a powerful speech. But they weren't a bit ashamed to cry out to God for help. Um, in fact, he went on, it's the duty of mankind to acknowledge their dependence on the divine being, that Almighty God would mercifully interpose and still the rage of war among the nations, and that He would take this province, this nation, under His protection, 
and confound the designs and defeat the attempts of its enemies. Talking about Great Britain and all the enemies that were trying to uh, come in with this spirit of Antichrist. And choke out this republic before it ever got born. He says, we better pray that God confuses them and, and confounds them. And for our defense and security in this time of danger. And they did pray. And God did answer their prayers. Pretty amazing. John Witherspoon was a signer of the Declaration. He was president of Princeton. Heavily influential in the whole revolution. He said, whoever is an avowed enemy of God, I scruple not to call him an enemy of his country. If God blesses nations, and that's the key to happiness, and you're against God, denying Him, rejecting Him, mocking Him, cursing Him, how are you helping my country? It just doesn't compute. In fact, I'd go so far as to say, if you're against God, you're an enemy of my country. We need God. Now, these are the founders way before their, everything was even settled, you know, saying all of this. Thomas Jefferson, again, he'd be in the same category with Franklin. We don't know if he got saved. But he said, I have little doubt that the whole country will soon be rallied to the unity of our Creator, and I hope to the pure doctrines of Jesus also. And again, referring to the Creator, but also referring to Jesus. Alexander Hamilton, I've carefully examined the evidences of the Christian religion, and I would unhesitatingly give my verdict in its favor. I can prove its truth as clearly as any proposition ever submitted to the mind of man. He sounds like he's pretty convinced. Then he says, in my opinion, the present Constitution is the standard to which we are to cling. Let an association be formed, the Christian Constitutional Society, and its object to be first the support of the Christian religion, second the support of the United States. They had the priorities right, didn't they? Amen. I mean, they were looking at this saying, look, we better keep God where God belongs. That's the whole declaration. Put God where he belongs. Earthly kings are not to lord over us. They're to protect us. We've got to acknowledge God. And then he's saying, look, it's so important that future generations get this right. Let's form this constitutional society. And the number one goal is to support Christianity. Teach it, preach it, help people get a hold of it. And then secondly, we'll talk about our country. Because the United States is going to be affected by its people, whether they're godly or not, whether they're Christian or not. Samuel Adams, the right to freedom being the gift of God Almighty, the rights of the colonists as Christians may best be understood by reading and carefully studying the institutions of the great lawgiver, that would be Moses given the law by God in the Old Testament, and the head of the Christian church, that would be Jesus, which are to be found clearly written and promulgated in the New Testament. So I, I could pull a lot of quotes out from all these guys, but this is just one example of them saying, look, uh, the rights to freedom that we understand as Americans are based on the Creator and Jesus and their laws from the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's how we understand freedom. I'll explain more about that after this quote. Look at Patrick Henry who said, give me liberty or give me death, Right? He said, it cannot be too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions in general, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. So what was their concept of having one nation under God? They believed that a Christian nation would guarantee freedom for you to decide if you want to be a Christian. Why? Because Christ gives you the freedom to decide, do you want to be a Christian? So the way it operated before was, nope, 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 you're a member of this state, so you're a member of this church, and we're going to baptize you when you're, uh, right after you're born, we're going to claim it, <laughs> claim you, and you're part of us, and that is set in stone, and that's just the way it's going to be. That's not Christianity. 
You, you don't baptize people before they trust Christ. But that's the mentality that had, had, had been around for years. And they're learning how to break away from that and say, you know what? Because we are truly Christian. What's truly Christian? Truly Christian means we preach the truth, we let God convict the heart, and we let the citizens decide if they're going to get saved or not. And they are accountable for themselves, and everything will work itself out as long as we have the freedom to preach. Because we believe that the truth will prevail and that people in the end really do want to be saved and they really do want a better life. So a Christian nation creates the freedom of religion so we can preach so you can make up your own mind. But never did they imply that we are going to uh, force you to trust Christ or to be Christian. In fact, he said it in his own words, it's because of Christianity other faiths can come here and have freedom of religion. And that's interesting, isn't it? Where was freedom born? It was born in a Christian nation. It wasn't born in a Muslim nation. Do you find freedom of religion in a Muslim nation? Do you find freedom of religion in a Hindu nation? Do you find freedom of religion in an atheist nation such as socialist or communist? No, they clamped down on all that. Freedom was born in a Christian nation. And it doesn't mean nobody else can preach anything. In fact, we encourage it, right? Open discourse. Hey, preach. As long as I can preach the truth and counter what you're saying, the truth will prevail. We're not afraid to have, let these other religions come in as long as we can preach because we know the power of the gospel. Amen. But when you silence the Christians and let everybody else speak, then we're in trouble. Why, why would you be so afraid of the Christians speaking? <laughs> because of the threat that, of the power of the message to them. So it's, it's fascinating. Uh, some people say, oh, you just want, you know, to in, impose your morality on everybody and make this a Christian, make us all be Christians. Well, the truth is there's going to be morality imposed somehow. You, you don't have rules and enforce rules without some code of morality. Like, what's right, what's wrong? Somebody's going to decide what's right and what's wrong. So any form of government is imposing their version of morality. The question is, is it going to be based on God's word? You know, in the, in the Declaration of Independence, they said, they referred to the laws of nature and nature's God. Right? And then they went on to say that we're created in God's image with, uh, or with certain inalienable rights by the Creator. And then they go on to say, we're relying on His protection, His divine protection as we go forward with this cause. So it, they talked about God all the way through it, but basically they're saying, here's what we want to do. We want to acknowledge the laws of nature and nature's God because they understood that what's going on out there in creation is only because God set it in motion. And we want a nation that will submit to that. That's what they mean by one nation under God. We're just, we're going to acknowledge the laws of nature and nature's God. And we're going to set up a nation that agrees with that. Here was their idea. If you're going to go against that, if you're going to throw away the laws of nature and nature's God, you're fighting a losing battle. You cannot be blessed because sooner or later, it's like your head hitting against a wall. It, it, you're not going to go forward. You're not going to be blessed. You're kidding yourself. You're going to throw off reality and expect that that's going to turn out good for you? So their, their idea of a, a nation under God was, look, we have got to accept some standard of right and wrong. And over and over, they talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then they say, we want a nation that conforms to that. As a nation. Now, you can't make every individual serve the Lord with their life. But you can create an environment where they are free to serve the Lord. And encourage it and not be ashamed of the truth. 
Here's Noah Webster, the grand uh, American uh, father of education, who said, the religion which has introduced civil liberty or freedom is the religion of Christ and his apostles. This is genuine Christianity, and to this we owe our free constitutions of government. The principle that the individual is valuable, the principle that government ought to be protecting the individual, the the principle that that individual should hear all the messages they want to hear, and then they get to make up their mind, am I going to trust Christ or trust some other thing? That's all because of Christianity, and to this we owe our freedom, our free constitutions of government here in America. Here's John Adams, our second president, our first vice president. He was heavily involved in the whole thing. I love this quote. Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book, and every member of that nation should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited to justice, kindness, charity towards his fellow men, to piety and being spiritual, reverent, uh, love, reverence toward Almighty God. What a utopia, what a paradise would this region be? It hadn't happened. They didn't know if it could work or would work or if people would do it, you know, but he's just dreaming. Wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could move somewhere on this planet where people loved the law of God? And it affected their actions to justice and kindness and charity. Genuine, sincere, God-fearing people. Wouldn't you rather have that kind of a person as your neighbor? as opposed to some immoral, you know, selfish thief. What a utopia that would be if you could just find that place. Is it possible on earth to have a place that submits to the law of God, openly preaches it and loves it? Look at this next quote because he said this later on. The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the principles of Christianity. These are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God and that those principles of liberty are as unalterable as human nature. He's just saying, I think we did it. Our fathers held up the word of God and they tried to set up a system of government that went along with these principles from Deuteronomy and and all the other things that we learned through Israel. They really tried. And I think we've done it. He was excited. Alexis de Tocqueville, you've probably heard about him. He came from France. His family was very wealthy, wealthy and they lived through the French Revolution, right? And it was a bloody, horrible mess. They were trying to have liberty without God. Now, we're not going to do all that God stuff, but we like the idea of freedom, liberty. And it turned into tyranny again. And the execution of all kinds of innocent people. And de Tocqueville was just a young man watching all this. And then he keeps hearing about America. This was in the 1830s. So we're only about 50 years old at this time. He gets on a ship, comes over, and he spends nine months interviewing shopkeepers, farmers, preachers, politicians. He goes to the universities. He's trying to figure out what's happening here. He called America the freest, most enlightened nation on the earth. We're only 50 years old. But this is a guy from France saying there's something about these guys and I've got to figure out what it is. He said the Americans combine the notions of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds it is impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. He was kind of shocked because he was thinking like in France, you have the state over here, you have God over here. And there's a great gulf fix between them, right? And it didn't work. He comes to America and he's like, no, I'm trying to ask you guys about the state, about freedom, about how you set this up. And he said, I can't get the Americans to talk about that without talking about God. In their minds, it's so interwoven, you can't separate it. What have, whatever happened to us, right? We've fallen for the lie uh, that you've got to separate all that. No, you don't. No, you don't. We're talking about life. 
We're talking about human beings created by God. We live in a moral universe, and he has the authority to tell us what's right and wrong. And for us to go along with that and submit to it is not foolish at all. It's wise. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Serve the Lord. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Jesus. It is doable. And I just find it fascinating. He wrote this big old book called Democracy in America, talking about all these interviews that he had with these Americans in the early 1800s. Pretty fascinating. Congress said in 1854, the great vital and conservative element in our system is the belief of our people in the pure doctrines and divine truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is quite a while after our birth, and, and basically they're just saying, look, here's what sets us apart, makes us different from the other nations. We're not ashamed of the gospel. I mean, that's, that's deep in us. And this is, you know, we're sending out more missionaries than any other country had ever sent out. Herbert Hoover. We believe that all men are created equal because they're created in the image of God. Our founding fathers did not invent the priceless boon of individual freedom and respect for the dignity of men. That great gift to mankind sprang from the creator and not from governments. Our, our founding fathers didn't invent some new way to do things. They simply tapped into what was already there that no other nation had ever really tapped into. Said, so, okay, let's see if it'll work. Let's put God's word to the test. And instead of having a king, remember when he told Israel, you don't want a king. They'll, they'll overtax you. They'll take your men off to war. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll enslave your daughters. I mean, you don't want a king. For 400 years, they had been one nation under God. Right? They just had judges. They didn't need a king because we understood who the real authority was. It was God and his laws. And so the founders looked at all that and said, you know what? I think a Gentile nation could do it. Let it be here. And he said, they didn't, they didn't create this. They just tapped into it. Eisenhower said, without God, there could be no American form of government nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. Thus the founding fathers of America saw it, and thus with God's help it will continue to be. I've gotten online a little bit and heard people respond to Eisenhower like, oh man, this all started with Eisenhower trying to steal the country and make it some kind of a Christian nation. And I'm just thinking, wow, wow. It's, it's amazing that you think because he was responsible, he oversaw the putting one nation under God in the pledge and in God we trust on the coins. And he's saying, listen, the founders did this and thus the founding fathers saw it and thus with God's help it will continue to be. All he was doing was trying to preserve that for future generations. If anyone stole anything, it wasn't God's people stealing something. It was the enemies of God trying to steal our history from us. We were just trying to, he was just trying to preserve it and make sure that it didn't get stolen. He went on to say in another place, any organization such as that is can well take the Bible in one hand and the flag in the other and march ahead. I love this. You know, in, in his mind, and for generations, Americans have understood this. You got a Bible in this hand, an American flag in this hand, no problem. On this platform, you've got a Christian flag, an American flag, no problem. Isn't that, isn't that terrible to have an American flag on your church platform? Not at all. Did God give us government? Yes. Why wouldn't we be a part of that? Why wouldn't we be praying for that? Why wouldn't we be encouraging our government and our nation to be a godly nation? Of course it's fine. But, but our founders understood this. That is protecting that. And that's God's plan. We're Christians trying to preach the gospel build churches, send missionaries, shine the light. And that's protecting us while we do it. It's what the Constitution, or it's what the Declaration said. And Eisenhower is just saying, I got no problem with that. Grab your flag, grab your Bible, let's go. 
Here's Jedediah Morse. He was a uh, colonel in the Revolutionary War. His son, Samuel Morse, helped uh, develop the telegraph and write the Morse code. I mean, these guys were just amazing. But he said, to the kindly influence of Christianity, we owe that degree of civil freedom which mankind now enjoys. In proportion as the genuine effects of Christianity are diminished in any nation, the people of that nation recede from the blessings of genuine freedom and approximate the miseries of complete despotism. <laughs> now, I know it's a lot of big words, but basically despotism is tyranny. All right. Despotism is like government, total government in control of everything. They knew all about that. That's what they fled. So he's saying, look, on this end of the scale, you've got total and complete government. On this end of the scale, you have freedom because of Christianity and limited government. And the, as far as I'm concerned, he's saying, those are your two options. And if you, the further you get from Christianity, the closer you get to that. The other religions seem to just kind of go along with that and, melt and mesh with it and, and, and are willing to play the game. But he says it's Christianity that stands out and says, listen, we ought to obey God rather than men. We have one king. His name is Jesus. They used to ask the founder or, you know, the patriots back in the colonial days of uh, the British army would come in trying to figure out who's who. They'd say, who's your king? Declare your loyalty. And all through those colonies there on the East Coast, they would say, we have no sovereign but God and we have no king but Jesus. <laughs> right to the British. Why? Because they wanted them to know, you don't own us. God does. Amen. And it, when it boils down to it, we're going to follow God. You'll just have to do whatever you think you got to do. But we're following God. He's our king. And Jedediah Morse is basically saying, the further you get from that, the more you get close to despotism. He also said, whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present Republican forms of government and all the blessings which flow from them must fall with them. This is amazing because this was, he fought in the Battle of Bunker Hill. I mean, this is old. You know, this is a couple hundred years ago. And he's basically saying, look, guys, if we ever stray from the Christian principles and these pillars that have made us free, we're headed towards despotism. Don't think at some point, because you're so blessed, that you can throw off God and keep the blessings. The blessings will fall with it. And that's one thing we've got to understand in modern America. If we get rid of our Christian heritage and we are, as church, we remain silent and we're no longer involved and we're not going to speak up, we're just going to let the world, it's the world, they do what the world does and, and, and we just kind of go with the flow and let it get out of hand. The blessings will go. I don't expect to, to get rid of God and we're just going to keep going and there's plenty of food in the grocery stores and our water's clean and we've got plenty of everything. In fact, look at some of these states that seem to be angry at God, enemies of God. It's not going well for them. But that'll be the whole nation if it continues. And these guys knew that. That was before we even were blessed like we are now. So what do we do? I just want to challenge you in, in a couple areas as far as applying what we've heard tonight. I think, first of all, we need to acknowledge God's Word, right? I mean, is Psalm 2 correct? Is it true? Is it right? Should a nation honor God? Yes, a nation should. Could a nation honor God? Apparently. He told us to. So is that like wrong for me to impose that on my neighbor? Not at all. Preach it, teach it, encourage them, bring them along, pray for them, convert them. Let's get going. Let's get a nation that will honor God again. You can't make them do it. It's got to be their own choice. But we shouldn't just give up either. Right. Offer hope. Speak the truth in love. It's true. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It's just true. We've got to believe that. Then secondly, we ought to appreciate America's history. Don't let Satan steal it from us. 
Don't let him twist it and pervert it. Was everybody perfect back then, saints? Not at all. <laughs> I mean, any more than like today. You look around, churches, pastors, politicians, uh, you know, they say some good things, but they say some crazy things. I, they're people. And they weren't perfect back then, just like they're not perfect now. But that doesn't negate the good things that they did say. And that's what we honor. That's what we lift up. Appreciate America's history. There, uh, Margaret Thatcher said this. I don't have the quote in here, but she said, to have freedom, you have to have the responsibility to handle the freedom. And you can't have the responsibility without an understanding of the Bible, the Old and the New Testament. This is Margaret Thatcher. Then she said, your founding fathers came over with that. They came over with an understanding of these principles and a, a, a belief that it was their duty to God to covenant together, keep each other accountable, their leaders accountable, as a duty to themselves and God. And then she said, there is no other country in the world which started that way. Don't let Satan rob us of an amazing, unique history. So we need to point fellow citizens to God. I love this quote, and I'll close with this one from Ronald Reagan. He said, our nation's motto, in God we trust, was not chosen lightly. It reflects a basic recognition that there is a divine authority in the universe to which this nation owes reverence. Throughout our history, Americans have put their faith in God, and no one can doubt that we've been blessed for it. Pretty powerful while recognizing that the freedom to choose a godly path is the essence of liberty. I love that line. So rich. Recognizing that the freedom to choose a godly path is the essence of liberty. We're not forcing you to choose a godly path, but you have the freedom to choose a godly path. And isn't that what we really want for ourselves, for our kids? as they grow up and become adults, we don't want all this pressure demonizing Christianity and the Word of God and purity and marriage. And No, we want them to have the essence of liberty is that they would have the freedom to choose the good path. Then he goes on, as a nation, we cannot but hope that more of our citizens would, through prayer, come into a closer relationship with their Maker. That's the answer. Just keep spreading the gospel. Never be ashamed of the truth. Lift up the Creator. Lift up Jesus. That's the only hope for this nation or any nation. We've got to stay involved because this is where we live. And, uh, you know, we're just waiting for the rapture. You know, my grandkids, I think the oldest one is nine now. Did he turn nine yet? You know, you say, well, maybe Jesus will come in the next 50 years. It's basically over anyway. Well, my grandson will be 59. That's a long time for him. And 50 years is nothing to the Lord. I don't know when he's coming. He could come tonight. That'd be great, wouldn't it? But he said, I'm leaving you there, and I'm, I want you to occupy till I come. There are no excuses. You stand in there, you fight the good fight, you preach the truth, you do everything you know to do, and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. No excuses to back off right at the very end, right before the last victory, before we hear the trumpet sound. God, help us to renew our, our love for history, our love for these principles, and then let's get busy applying it today. Let's bow our heads, if you would, and Lord, I just ask that you would speak to hearts and speak to my heart. Challenge me. Help all of us, Lord. We are here at this time in history. Help us to live by faith. Help us to have your wisdom. Help us to understand that really at stake are the hearts and minds and souls of eternal individuals that you created. Lord, help us as we fight the lies with truth. 
Convict all of us, Lord, about how we can do better, how we can use our talents and abilities to get the truth to this generation. And I pray that you would encourage and inspire people all around this land who are still God-fearing patriots. Show us the way. Teach us to do your will. Help us to know how to respond, how to stand against the wiles of the devil. Please, that you would be glorified and that Jesus Christ and the gospel would be lifted up. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.